Welcome to a Kickstarter review and first impressions video. We are, I literally just got the notification that the Kingdoms Forlorn Kickstarter just went live. You can already see tons and tons of people are already pledging. They've already pledged their their goal and I'm not surprised. Uh, like I mentioned in my last Kingdoms Forlorn video, I think this is going to be just as, if not more successful than Aeon Trespass Odyssey. And it's already shaping up to be a very successful Kickstarter. Now, I have not looked at anything. I've, I'm actually recording this on my lunch break. And so I just wanted to dive in, read through everything, uh, buckle in. We're going to go through every single thing I'm going to read, everything out pretty much, and sort of talk about my first impressions on what we can maybe expect and sort of what my hopes are for this Kickstarter. So let's just dive into it. Now, if you don't know what King Kingdoms Forlorn is, it is a, you know, one to four player solo operative. So it can be played either solo or up to four players. Um, uh, sort of narrative dungeon delving boss battler experience uh and i just say experience because this game seems so ambitious that it's looking to hit like a lot of different notes it even has like roguelite elements in it uh there's dungeon delving elements tile revealing boss battling rpg elements it's gonna be a big one so let's let's just grab a cup of coffee and uh let's just dive into it so uh let's see so obviously leading up with the story at dawn god created the world and it was good. Also, let me make some more room here. There we go. At dusk, he created man and an immortal soul, but weak to temptation. At night, darkness brought out brought the devils out. Welcome to Kingdoms Forlorn. So that's sort of their tagline. It's uh, 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 dragons, devils, and kings, I think is their tagline. Uh, so obviously they're going with that theme. Very, very dark, grim world that I'm super, super excited to dive into. Uh, so it's a truly tactical dungeon crawler, a truly cooperative adventure, a truly narrative-driven board game. Truly epic. And uh, yeah, a lot of the stuff that they're they're touting definitely seems to be reflective of that as well. Um, so we have, let's see. Kingdoms Forlorn is the newest epic uh, massive board game from Into the Unknown, offering an immersive co-op and solo experience for one to four players. Quest through a dark medieval fantasy world through deep in uh, innovatively structured stories and endless roguelite delves. Customize your night and play with your core group, or pack up and take your night to gaming groups around the world. Co-op solo wandering from campaign to campaign, following a story or venturing for unscripted legendary hunts. You decide how you play. Now, a lot of this stuff ticks a lot of the boxes for me. Obviously huge in co-op, huge in a dark fantasy. Uh, I love roguelites. The roguelite part, I'm still a little bit hesitant about on how well they're able to implement that. Additionally, the fact that they're, you're able to take your knight and play with other groups around the world, that seems a little bit fluffy to me. Like, I don't think there's going to be really anyone who's going to actually take their knight and go out and play, uh, you know, across the world. I don't know how big this game is going to be. I don't know if it's going to be like a Dungeons and Dragons situations where you have like core communities around the world that are actually, you know, having people, having multiple different play groups. Um, but it's not like you're... I mean, at least for my group, I can only speak anecdotally, but I also assume considering the price of this game, uh, which for me is around 200 Canadian dollars, and that's not including shipping. Um, I don't think a lot of people are going to have multiple people in their gr uh, group of friends going to be getting this game. So you're not really going to need to bring your night over to other people. Um, so that part, I think, is a little bit tacked on. Uh, it's, a, it's a cool thing that it's like it's there for people who can use it, um, but I'm just wondering how well it's going to be actually implemented. Uh, there's over 150 hours of narrative gameplay with over a thousand unique illustrations, dozens of, dozens of unique giant miniatures, and hundreds of cards. You can see by this picture here, this is massive. Uh, again, Aeon Trust Plus Odyssey was also a massive, massive game. Uh, I, unfortunately, there we go. It's a little bit blurry when I zoom in, but you can sort of see all the different things layout. Like, you're going to need a pretty big table to actually table this game because there's going to be a, there's a, the, just looking at some of the game, latest gameplay videos from like Board Game Co. and Quackalope. There's just so much to manage. Um, I actually put in my request, put in a request for a prototype copy. I'm a small channel, but hey, you never know. She might as well shoot my shot. Personally, I'm a rules guy, so I think I could actually do a pretty good job at representing the game. That's just my opinion. Not biased at all. Uh, and uh, yeah, so there's tactical escalating battles with bosses and mobs, strategic delves into forgotten kingdoms, deep cooperation with hard co-op, branching adventures and deep personal narratives. Unscripted hunts and solo operative experience that allows you to play your knight and uh, allows you to play with your knight anywhere with anyone, regardless of campaign and level differences. A bold, dark medieval world with lore and secrets to uncover. So again, they're sort of telling you that you can sort of take your knight anywhere. Again, how well that's going to be implemented. The fact that it's going to be regardless of campaign and level differences. 
again, just adds to that ambition level. And, and you know, having a system like that be able to work seamlessly seems extremely difficult. And this is like their only set. What this is their like only second game. Uh, so yeah, I'm I'm very excited to see how challenging it's going to be. Uh, again, I watched Quackalope's latest gameplay video. They were struggling a lot with the rules, so and I believe they did get some rules wrong where it did make it easier for them to finish the fight, or at least made the made it so they finished the fight quicker. So again, can't really take that video into representation of how the game actually plays because A, it's a prototype, and B, again, they, they were struggling with the rules, uh, and that's prior, just due to it being incomplete rules mainly. Uh, so why why are you back us? Okay, so let's see what we actually get. So you want to get a discounted price? All right, uh, early bird. Yeah, it's pretty st straightforward Kickstarter stuff. Uh, uh, you get it early. Uh, now it says you will receive the game at least a few months before it hits normal distribution. So I'm wondering if this game is going to actually end up getting to retail or not. Uh, you want to influence the process? Uh, pretty straightforward Kickstarter blabble. Um, yeah, don't need to read about that because that's just again Kickstarter fluff. Uh, some, some really great art. Again, this is one of the main reasons why, or one of the big thing, draws for me for this game is the world and the art. And they have just, uh, kudos to their art team. They just have a way of really making a, an intriguing world just through the visuals that makes you want to dive in more and learn more about it. Um, so a board game cannot miss. So solo operative, each night follows an individual campaign with personal consequences. That seamlessly weaves in all other night campaigns and stories of the kingdoms themselves into a one-of-a-kind procedurally generated saga with deep narratives and multiple story twists. These storylines diverge and intersect in, in surprising ways, and you can mix and match knights, kingdoms, monsters, levels, and ranks for endless diversity. Again, like a lot of this stuff is just feature, what I call feature fluff, where it's like in a in a in a vacuum, in a perfect world, this all sounds amazing, but how well is it gonna actually play? That's an entirely different story, and we just won't have the answers to that until we actually get our hands on it, unfortunately. Uh, tabletop shared worlds with drop-in, drop-out co-op. So again, it seems like this is going to be a really big feature for them. It seems like they are trying to make it so they, you know, sort of encourage you to take your knight to other other groups. Um, I guess that is just going to mainly be dependent on your city, because I... Of course, I don't think people are going to actually fly or drive miles to actually play this game with other groups with their own night. However, if you are in a city, a larger city, like for myself, I'm in a not like a huge city or anything like that. So it's going to be unlikely there's going to be many people in my city that are even going to own this game. So really, it's just going to be me and my group of friends. Um, but I, I do like the fact that I can play solo, though. That is a big thing because I, I will be recording solo content. I will be, you know, wanting to play solo uh, potentially. Uh, and then being able to just take my knight and implement it into my friend's campaign uh, when we play together. That's a pretty cool concept. Uh, there's dynamic difficulty and a smart director. There's no level requirements for playing with others, both in story campaigns as well as post-game. In other words, you can take your experienced knight on a delve with newbies, and thanks to the presence, smart director, TM, trademarked, the game will balance itself so everybody enjoys an appropriate challenge level. Again, idea sounds great. How well is it going to work? Who knows? Dungeon Delver. Kingdoms for Lauren is the next step of evolution for board game dungeon crawlers with tactical delves that have purposes and stakes. Gone are the days of pointless wandering through random rooms. In ca uh, Kingdoms for Lauren, every move of your party counts, and even though the kingdom is created as you play, ensuring no two delves are alike, it's highly focused, quest-driven, and narratively rich. Um, I'm excited about the del delve aspect. Um, it does seem like watching the gameplay videos that I've seen so far, it does take quite a long time. Again, they were sort of struggling with rules and stuff, though, in the middle of that. So it, it's going to be tough to say. I personally love the dungeon delve aspect. I do. And that, like, that's one of my, it, it sort of replaces the hunt um, aspect of Kingdom Death Monster, uh, where that's where a lot of the emergent stories come from is a lot of the random events that happen. And the fact that Kingdoms for Lauren has quite a few of those, it seems like, and also those are meaningful, especially considering they cater towards your individual knight. That seems like a lot of fun, and it's especially going to be fun because I will definitely want to pass the storybook around to my friends and let them read off their own stories. Typically, I usually do all the reading, um, and because yeah, I'm usually the one with my head in the rule book as well. So I'm usually the one that playing like that DM sort of role. But it'll be nice to sort of hand off the book to my friends and have them read out the stories and us sort of just being invested in the world. So I'm really excited about the dungeon delve aspect personally. 
Uh, it's a vast world of meaningful choices and lasting consequences. Each kingdom is built on layers upon layers of mechanical intricacies for you to master and secrets for you to uncover. As you customize your knight over dozens of hours of delves, battles, and stories, you will make hard choices that will permanently influence your character, their loadouts, their story, and ultimately their end. So this was this uh, one thing Quackaloop also did mention. Uh, Jesse said that, you know, failing a battle or something is not always the end. Uh, it is going to potentially ne uh, affect you negatively, but it, it essentially it's just going to be one of those situations where you're branching off on a different path uh, as opposed to succeeding and going off on a different different path. So I'm all for that. Um, I like I like that. I am curious as to what exactly will cause your night to actually die and end and like the, ac the game actually be over. And I'm also wondering if a knight dies or can a group die altogether, do you restart from the beginning? Or do you, is there like a checkpoint system where you just sort of start from a certain point? Uh, because you can, you know, because you can insert your knight in any group, it's implied that, you know, you can sort of start almost wherever, uh, depending on where the campaign is. So I wonder if they're going to have uh, a system like that. So escalating battle. So this is going to be their inverted combat paradigm 2.0. I don't really like those buzzwords, but that's what they called their battle system in Aeon Trespass Odyssey. This is going to be the next step up from that. Uh, thanks to our tried and true inverted combat paradigm mechanics, your battles will only become more heated as you go on and more powerful as you get closer to death. Unlike most games, but similarly to our first outing Aeon Trespass Odyssey, the clashes have a distinct... Uh, clashes being, I believe, their boss battles have a distinct... Uh, or their fights, I guess, have a distinct heroic flow as the fight goes on and your enemies get closer to death, your power and abilities will grow. This means there's no defeat snowball effect, no negative modifiers that keep stacking up, hindering your options and making you a glorified spectator. There's always a chance at a comeback. The closer you are to death, the more powerful you become, and this is what makes the clashes of Ca Kingdoms Forlorn sing and pass into legend. Victory is never assured. Defeat is never... Ine uh, defeat never inevitable. So uh, that is one thing that I, you know, playing the tabletop simulator demo for Aeon Trespass Odyssey, I did actually like how their battle system worked, even though I don't like the name. <laughs> um, it is really, really cool getting extra abilities as you get more damaged. Again, it does create this really interesting bad, uh, balancing act. Um, I am curious to see sort of what improvements they make over Aeon Trespass Odyssey's battle system. Um, so that'll be, yeah, that'll be pretty interesting to see. Hard co-op, a true co-op experience where you really need to work with other players to succeed both during battles as well as in delves and story encounters. We achieve this through co-op actions, things you, to, things you do to directly benefit other players. After each of your attacks, you will choose and leave a set of tokens that will influence the turn on the next uh, player in order, make them easier to hit, make them hit easier, wound more severely, evade attacks, etc., etc. Um, and beyond that, we introduce special co-op attacks that will need, you will need to take down the most dangerous foes. Um, so... Again, that sort of ties into their combat system from Aeon Trespass Odyssey. Uh, if you haven't played Aeon Trespass Odyssey on Tabletop Simulator, at least their demo, um, that's sort of the way their battle system works is you're able to, when you attack, leave behind either uh, tokens that like give a plus modifier to attack for the next person or like plus to wound and stuff like that. I love that system. I think it's actually fantastic. It does add a little bit more of the cooperative aspect into the game um, where you are able to influence your team and help your team out more um, whereas in something like Kingdom's Death Monster, it's it's a little bit more individual. Um, the co-op attacks will be interesting to see too on, on how well you can actually implement those. Endless post-game. Your night campaigns are just the beginning. Kingdom's for Lauren provides you with a framework for a rich post-game experience with additional levels of monsters, new challenges, expanded kingdoms, new customization options, and new goals for players who can't get enough. In other words, night is just the first rank of many. Oh, so there is going to be an overall rank system. I like that idea. So that probably ties into line with their roguelite elements that they want to put into the game. And I love I love the roguelite elements in Townsfolk Tussle. I think roguelites are fantastic for a board game setup. Being able to unlock things for future runs and future events. Uh, again, just adds to the replayability. Um, and being able to make each new run as different as possible through new discoveries is important just for you know player entertainment. Um, so I like that. The the idea that you could potentially rank up your knight to different ranks and gain new stuff. I, I, I like that. That's a That seems like a lot of fun. Permanent changes. Last but not least is the way your previous campaigns will set the world up for the next. Knights who finish their campaigns will leave a permanent mark on their corner of the Kingdoms Forlorn world by introducing new rules, items, and stories. Another roguelite element. Um, it was almost like a prosthetic, like, mechanical arm. That's pretty cool. So... Hmm. So I'm I'm wondering how how that's gonna work, um, and how much you'll how much you're actually gonna be affecting the worlds. Uh, 
it's, it seems like it's going to be almost similar to like Townsfolk Tessel's roguelike system where if you complete special objectives, you just get like, you, you shuffle in like new items into the world, essentially. Um, the permanent changes is going to be interesting because that also means with how branching the narrative is, I'm wondering if you go down a certain path, you finish your campaign, would there be possi the possible chance that you make a permanent change for your future run that makes it almost impossible to get that other branching path that you didn't go through the first time. I would have assumed they would have thought of something like that, but again, <laughs> ambitious game in a perfect world. This sounds awesome. It's gonna, uh, it, we'll see how it actually works out. True solo mode. Okay, so I'm pretty uh, interested to see what this is about. So Kingdoms Forlorn, Dragons, Devils, and Kings is built upon our tried and true mechanic of combat escalation and hard co-op mechanics, pitting four knights players against an uncompromising foe that is the Kingdoms Forlorn themselves. However, it is also an experience meant to be enjoyed by smaller groups of players, including full solo play. The full game will include a true solo mode where you can venture into the kingdom alone. In true solo mode, rules are simplified and automated while retaining both escalation and hard co-op elements. The absence of other knights will cut down on management and let you focus on what's important. Your personal journey through the st strange and terrifying kingdoms. The presence of semi-autonomous squires will ensure your battles are still gripping and tactical, retaining all the magic of the four-player gameplay while speeding up the game and eliminating any barriers to entry. This is fantastic to hear. Uh, so, like I mentioned in my last Kingdoms for Lauren video, I was hoping that they would have like specific mechanics, things that make it a true solo experience. Seems like they're really thinking about that. Um, whether, again, whether or not it's going to run well as a solo game, and there's going to be enough automata uh, automation that managing everything isn't going to be as overwhelming. Again, we don't even... The prototype was that content creators have shown has been geared towards actually having four people to play with. So we have no clue how this is going to work. Um, I'm wondering if the tabletop simulator demo they're going to have for this game is going to include some solo rules. So that hopefully, we, you know, I'll be making a video on that and I'll be playing through that as well. So definitely subscribe if you want to keep an eye out for that. Um, however, yeah, it'll be interesting to see. It is nice that they're adding it in there. Uh, cause again, I, I think especially in a game like this, that is at least first impression wise, very, fairly fiddly to deal with potentially not having enough friends around you that are interested in trying to get through a game like this. It will be nice to just be able to play alone and just still enjoy the full experience. All right. So game content. So early bird. So you've back us day one during the uh, first 24 hours and get, uh, oh, so you get two early bird rewards for free. You save, you save $10. Cool. I mean, I'll, I'll be backing. I haven't backed it yet because I wanted to record this video right away, but I'll be, I'll be back in this for sure. Uh, so you, we also get the little sirs, little mini. Uh, so this is one of the knights sort of mini companions in this story. Uh, back in the first 24 hours to get the exclusive sir Sanchez little sir miniature. Nice little bonus. Um, little Sir, the intrepid scout monkey of Sir Sanch is already present in the game as a cardboard token. He can sniff out weak points, distract enemies, and be all, all around a nuisance. Now you get him in this adorable little mini form. Nice. Um, early bird, Commonwealth Princess. Um, so you get the Commonwealth Princess in Battle Gear miniature. So Commonwealth Princess, I'm guessing, is one of the characters. Princess Slavia, maiden of battle, heir to the throne of Commonwealth. Slavia is... Or is it Slavia? Slavia is a, a warrior princess of the forgotten Commonwealth now more commonly known as the Commonwealth of Ruin. So strong is her spirit that she is able to leave her homeland and wander through other kingdoms forlorn, looking for adventurers brave enough to stand with her one, uh, brave with her, or to stand with her once she returns to reclaim her rightful throne, for it was stolen by a vile curse. As long as Slavia is present on the battleboard, she will lend her strength to the clash, granting attack bonuses, immunity to fear, and may even perform a special co-op attack with her patron, the dreaded winged charge. Just don't let her die, for all hell will break loose. And yes, Slavia is an IT icon having debuted in another fantasy game of ours and has been seen in an extremely limited print run as a resin collectible until now. So yeah, uh, they did have another game. I can't remember what it's called, but I do recognize the Slavia word. Um, is it Monsters of Slavia or something? But it was like a card, like battle uh, type game that didn't, I don't think had a successful Kickstarter. Um, so that's cool. Uh, I'll be looking forward to getting my hands on that. All right, so we have the base pledge or the core game pledge. You can, of course, uh, pledge it without a reward uh, if you just want to support it and also keep track of stuff. Um, but Principality of Stone core game is uh, 159 US, um, 139 euros for us poor Canadians. It's $201, not including shipping. Um, so you get the four knight miniatures. So there's just the four base characters. You have Kara, Sir Sanch, Renholder, and Fleshrider. Uh, Fleischrider. 
uh, and that is, of course, those are the characters that you can see in, I believe, in the prototype as well. You get 10 iron cast dead mob standees. So these are your basic mob enemies um, that you're going to be doing for your dungeon delve battles as opposed to the boss battles, which are down here. You have the one egg knight vassal miniature. These are massive miniatures as well. 60 millimeter base. Uh, so you have the egg knight as a boss. We have puppet king Eldheart, uh, Edelheart. Uh, we have Devil of Smelted Fears. That's a super cool mini. And then, of course, we have the gigantic 100 millimeter base Panzer Dragon Velder miniature. Super, super awesome miniatures. So it seems like there's four base bosses. Um, so that's that's interesting. I'm wondering how many more bosses they're going to be adding potentially as future expansions. Because uh, when you think about, like, even like Kingdom Death, for example, had quite a few base bosses in the game already. Um, and I think Aeon Trespass Odyssey has a decent amount of bosses as well. So the fact that they only have four in this, I'm, I'm, it does seem like because they are focusing on more of the narrative story, the branching paths, as well as the actual Dungeon Delve fights, because this is not just like an only boss battle game, um, it seems like there's just like not a ton of different bosses because obviously that would just bump up the price and the development time. Um, you get your four knight sheets, five enemy sheets, you get 200 or, uh, plus battle cards. Uh, so these are like the AI cards, the body part, um, uh, injury cards for the bosses, traits, variants, you get 300 plus knight cards, which is all, all your skill gear and arc cards. Not sure what arc is, but, uh, all right. We got 50 plus map cards, which are going to be how you reveal the different tiles. Um, so this is like a tile revealer, but they actually have like cards instead of, you know, cardboard tiles, because obviously that would take way too much space. Um, 120 plus other cards, such as conditions, uh, mortis, and other cards. So like random effects, I'm assuming. You get 20 dice. Damn, that's a lot of dice. So it seems like their dice as well are fairly similar to Aeon Trespass Odyssey. You have different symbols where you can add like break tokens to, uh, you know, cause, you know, misses into successes. Um, you have the little sword icons that are successes themselves. You have the D10 system. It looks like they're also using the same system with Aeon Trespass Odyssey, where the white dice is considered the critical dice. And if you get a crit on that dice, uh, it counts as a critical. Um, this is just pure speculation going off their other game. Uh, you have 100 plus various tokens, uh, six, uh, 600 by 400 millimeter battle board. Love the, love the way the board looks as well. You get one kingdom and four knight tactics tracks. So these are just to keep track of your health stats, your heat, heat stat, power stat as well as the overall threat and curse level of the campaign. Because um, I believe if you max out on either of those, you lose. You have uh, lot, there's lots of books in this one. You have your rule book and your learn to play book. You have your kingdom book, which is going to include all of the different stories and narrative arcs. And then you have uh, four night books. So um, you have four different books, each four of the four starting characters. That's a lot of reading. Uh, again, I think a big part of this is the narrative aspect. So if you don't like reading, if you don't care about flavor text, this probably is not going to be the game for you because it seems like that is a heavy, heavy focus. So there's 10 chapter branching campaigns around 25 to 30 hours each. Now, from what I have seen as well from Crackle Open Board Game Co, the writing is, writing is extremely well done. So I'm very, very excited. So that gives me a lot of hope. It, it, it I'm glad that because it's a you know front feature of theirs, that they are really putting a lot of effort in their writing. Um, again, I'll be able to get a taste of this with Aeon Trespass Odyssey. Um, but uh, yeah, I'm really looking forward to diving in. So that's the base game. Um, okay, so they already have some expansions on this Kickstarter. Uh, that makes sense. So you have the Principality of Stone, the 10,000 Succulent Fears Deluxe expansion. So that's an additional 93, uh, 93 US, 82 euros. Um, do I have... It doesn't... Okay, so it doesn't list in Canadian, unfortunately, uh, what that is, but it's a lot um so that is going to include 10 more dead mob miniatures panzergeist mob miniatures mob standees as well so you get both uh if you don't you know okay so yeah the the iron cast dead mob miniatures are just the upgraded versions because in the base game you actually only get the dead mob standees interesting so they're actually including the base game miniatures in an expansion sneaky uh but then you get the extra um, bosses as well uh you get the young devoured dragon uh looks like you get two two potentially three uh new knights uh, what what size are the knights the knights are only 30 millimeters okay so that that one 
the two vassal miniatures are look like they're bosses. Uh, so you get three new bosses, it looks like, and one new knight. So you get the stone face knight miniature. You get two vassal miniatures. You get the knight eater, the stone mason knight, and the young dragon devour uh, young devour dragon as sort of the bosses for the expansion. Four enemy sheets. Yeah, extra cards for that expansion. You get yeah the one knight book for the stone face, and you get the expansion book. Um, I probably will not get the expansion again. Similar to Aeon Trespass Odyssey, I only backed the base pledge for the base game. There's already so much content in there, and just like Kingdom's Death Monster, I would rather just start with the base game and then add on expansions as I see fit, if I even need to. I probably won't need to. Um, but I mean, yeah, they do look they do look pretty cool. Um, so we'll see. Uh, so it looks like, yeah, it looks like they only have the one expansion uh, so far. Makes sense. The game's not, not even anywhere near close to done yet. Uh, so there are only, yeah, to make it simple, there's only two base, uh, two pledge levels. So you have your core game pledge. And then of course the elite core game pledge, uh, gives you the expansion. Um, plus of course, all the applicable stretch goals. Uh, you can check the complete contents of the core game and the deluxe expansion at the top of the page. And this pledge allows you to order add-ons. Yeah. So, I mean, there's not much point in going all out. I think at least not right now until we see more and learn more about the game. So I'm going to be just backing at the base pledge and then when they allow future add-ons if i am really really liking what i see then i'll get the uh add-on for the expansion uh, there may be other pledge levels introduced as the campaign goes on so check regularly if you're in okay so that's just pledge manager stuff uh, so this is just uh talking about how large the miniatures are so yeah their dragon is like 150 millimeters which is massive i'm guessing they're gonna have to have another box i wonder for like miniatures I mean, I, because I don't, I don't see how you can fit that miniature in in a box. Um, on, I, I, because I'm, I'm guessing it's gonna be pre-built. I can't, I don't know if Anna Trespass Odyssey is gonna be pre-built or not. To be honest, I don't even know. Or if they went like Kingdom Death Monster style, where you actually have to put it together. I think it's gonna be pre-built though. Um, so it looks like we have stretch goals for 150,000 euros, 300,000, and 400,000 euros. So it looks like followers. Um. I'm guessing followers are going to be just extra squires and stuff for their solo play, maybe? Or there are potential camp, uh, companions for your group as you travel and, and, and encounter new NPCs, maybe? That can give you, like, bonuses and, and extra things. Outposts, I'm guessing that is going to be just extra locations to explore and discover along the uh, exploration phase or the Dell phase of the game. And then Saint Urbane, that clearly looks like it's just going to be another knight. So if you want an extra character, um, I'm I I wouldn't I'd be surprised if we don't hit the four hundred thousand dollar. Let's see, let's see what the update is. We are at we're already at two hundred seventy three thousand Canadian dollars. Um, so and it's it's been thirty minutes. <laughs> so I am fairly confident they will end up getting all of their stretch goals done very very easily, and then they'll be adding more. 100% they're going to be adding more. I think they know that this is going to be a very successful game. Um, all right, so you can get more dice. <laughs> they give you 20 dice. I'd be surprised if you need more than that. Uh, battle mat, if you want to replace the cardboard battle board. Um, card protectors. Oh, interesting. So they actually are... That's smart. That's really, really smart, not only business-wise, because it just gives them more money, but also it's great because that's one big thing that people really, really don't like to do is go aftermarket and have to search up the card sizes. You know, usually on popular games like this, those card sizes end up getting sold out very quickly. So the fact that they can just get an add-on, now of course it's going to be at a much higher price than when you, if you would get it aftermarket. So I don't think it's necessary, but it is nice for people who just have more money than they don't want to you know, put in extra work to find aftermarket sleeves. That is that is nice to have. Um, so let's see the TTS epic. Oh, oh, so these are this is card sleeve expansion. Uh, protectors uh, and they have an art book uh, so the art book actually would be would, like I personally don't care for art books um, I do love the art in the game but I just don't really care about spending money on it but that's cool that they have that because their art has been fantastic from what I've seen so far uh, daily unlocks don't know what that is yet uh, it's only been day one uh, so here is the world so let's see we have once the known world is ruled. so here's some little flavor text for you uh, once the known world was ruled by the Grand Kingdoms, alas, its kings failed to listen to the good church and follow its commandments, and when the Pope warned about the coming cataclysm and devilry, his words fell on deaf ears. 
And then the curses came, and with them the deep fog, and soon the Grand Kingdoms become, became inaccessible, forsaken, and then forgotten. A giant white spot on the world map. Years passed. The border duchess, duchies, no longer curtailed by their powerful neighbors, came into their own. Noble lines flourished. Night orders were established. The church ro arose anew. And then the fog began to disperse. Uh, so this is... I'm not going to read through all this because uh, I think I've read enough, but this is essentially... They've gone over this in their blog post, but essentially just talking about what their goal is, especially mainly for the narrative side of things, um, and also hinting at like things like the roguelite elements. Um, so, yeah. Um, so how does it play? And I'm going to be drinking a lot of water. I apologize. Because we are talking a lot. So how does it play? A typical early campaign game may go like this. Each of the players selects a knight and reads their background and opening story. You can read it aloud, you can share all the details with others, but remember, this is your personal story and the choices will be yours and yours alone. Once each player establishes their goals and any rules that might influence the kingdom selection or setup, you choose a kingdom as a group, and each player prepares their own loadout. Their night sheet and track miniatures their current ability deck and their gear. It's important to prepare for the quest at hand, the kingdom you're venturing into, and to cooperate with others to, uh, to cover the deficiencies or highlight their strength. Set up the delve based on the current kingdom progress as well as other modifiers like the quests of the knights, unlocked secrets, chosen or forced vassals, or in mobs, or other monsters. And you go on a delve. Decide on your direction tile by tile, look for clues, solve riddles and riddles, uh, puzzles and riddles, mine the curse and threat levels, have random encounters and predetermined meetings, go on quest adventures which incorporating every peculiarity and the current quests. Battle at least two monsters or groups on a separate board, once in the middle of the delve and once at once at the end. Watch out for other nasty surprises, ambushes, battles, ambush battles, and devil visits. Once a clash happens, face a giant monster or vassal, or one of the cardinal forces of the kingdom, or a mob horde, or the curse itself, using your using our innovative innovating uh, innovative escalating combat mechanics that keep you on the edge until the very end. Defeat the bosses and finish the delve. Make hard choices on your personal storylines or be forced into others as a resulting as a result of your delve, battles, or previous choices that come back to haunt you. Move the kingdom story. See how your story influences others. Divide loot and resources. Decide if uh, any go to the common pool. Then craft or buy equipment. Develop your characters and move their stories along. Play with the same group. Play alone. Play with another group. Play with strangers. You decide. Each knight is different. Each monster is different. Each kingdom is different. The combination and possibilities are endless. Now, the biggest question I have is how long does a session actually take? As Because it seems like there's a ton of different things to manage, and especially if you are ending a session in the middle of a kingdom delve or something, setting up and taking things down might be very, very annoying. This is definitely going to seem like a game where if you are ending in the middle of a session with your friends, you're just going to leave it on the table until the next week type of deal, um, which I know not everyone has uh, the... Uh, and not everyone is able to do that. So I'm curious as to how long these uh, like sessions are going to take where it's going from like beginning to the end boss and how long that's going to take a group. But the, the general flow of it seems really, really fun. Uh, it seems like there's a lot of different customization. It seems like almost like a tabletop role playing game. You are meant to just sort of create your character as a you know, off the start. And because you do have like starting loadouts. So I'm curious as to how many different things you're able to choose off the start of the game. Uh, night customization is one of the gameplay highlights. Each night has a deep personal story developed by a crossing and branching tree of quests and side stories. Progression will unlock upgrades to your basic stats, ultra, uh, alternate heroic and peril arcs that let you tailor your knight to your playstyle, as well as a new powerful skill card, uh, new powerful skill cards and personal gear. And when you arrive at the end of your story, well, that's just the beginning. Um, cool. I'm all for character customization. The more character customization, the better. Tactical dungeon delving. M move deliberately through a procedurally generated kingdom, looking for clues and places that will move your current quests along. Lose use skill cards and gear to navigate traps, enemies, and traverse treacherous landscapes. Each kingdom offers its own peculiarities and strategies. Uh, curses and threats. Uh, yeah, we just gotta you just gotta mine that for story stuff. Uh, makes uh, story decisions. Make story decisions that influence you, the group, or uh or the fate of your group's kingdom, your decisions will shape who your knight is and what kind of end awaits them. Beware, some decisions will be pre presented as choices, but others will be made for you based on the way you play and engage with the game's mechanics. Branching narratives and lasting impact. Uh, all right, so these are just like summaries of the game features that we actually read earlier. I probably don't need to read through all this. But yeah, 
everything they're talking about is just checking off every box that I have in a game that I look for in a game. So I'm very, very excited about this. Um, doesn't seem to be like much more information from what their blog posts uh, leading up to this had. So people aren't really missing too much. Um, but of course, it's nice we're there. Uh, it's nice that it's, of course, summarized here for people who don't want to go back to their blog posts. Uh, so kingdoms. So the first kingdom we have is the Principality of Stone. So this is the one that's also referenced in the prototype that content creators have. Uh, so the Principality of Stone. Sad is the current state of this once grand kingdom. The capital, the iron smelters, the steel makers, and the alloy chivalry. Its crooked towers lie toppled by the great quakes. Broken streets give way to vast sinkholes. Soaring cathedrals crack like eggs lament to the heavens. Mighty castles entrenched uh, and impregnable against all manner of mortal and sourced and sourceled foes overturned like toys in absolute ruin. Metal fortifications fall under the weight of rust. Here the very earth has turned against the people. It began innocently enough with dainty pebbles. Sought after like jewels, they changed hands aplenty. But the pebbles carried a plague, and the plague turned to, st turned to stone anything it touched. Panic erupted. The anxious populace sought refuge in their legendary armor, foolishly believing the more protection they wore, the safer they would be. They were mistaken. In the final days of the curse, the land began to tremble. Earthquakes and unprecedented magnitude rolled through the principality, leaving in their wake de devastation and petrified corpses, and then the deep fog covered all. Today only monsters roam this principality of stone, the iron cast dead and the panzergeists whom even the peace of death was denied. The terrible and great Konig, uh, Konig's Manor, like the Egg Knight or the Night Eater, and above all them, the worm made stone, the pan panzer dragon. A king still rules from a castle hot up high, while the smelter devil stalks anyone who gets to, uh, gets close to the truth about the curse. And so you can tell by just like their intro to this kingdom here, like the writing is great. The writing is intriguing. The, the way they describe the world is super, super nice. Um, I really like the way they write stuff. It's, it's, uh, it's descriptive enough without being like too word fluffy and like using a lot of like intricate words just to make it sound nice. Um, I do like how it, it paints a very, very nice picture and it's easy to sort of go into your theater of mind and like imagine this place. Uh, other kingdoms, the desolation that, the, that is the Principality of Stone rises above the deep fog, an iron gauntlet for anyone who would dare venture into the kingdoms forlorn, but it is not the only kingdom, far from it. The sunken kingdom was drowned in mud, depravity and the legacy of the first sin. The barony of bountiful harvest overgrows with the curse of bloom. The red kingdom is drenched in blood and an unholy sacrament, and beyond that, beyond that lies the... Dun, dun, dun. So yeah, they are hinting at future expansion kingdoms. Which makes sense. Whether or not they're going to reveal all of them in this Kickstarter, only time will tell. Uh, so here is some... Uh, all right, this video is getting long enough, I think. Uh, this is a lot of flavor text stuff, which I don't think everyone cares about, but they, they go into a description of some of the monsters uh, in this first campaign, which is the main mob is going to be the Iron Cast Dead, which are these just skeletal monsters uh, clad in armor. Um, you have your Night Eater, uh, is the polar opposite of the Egg Knight, Interesting. <laughs> I love the way the Egg Knight looks. Um, Egg Knight is going to be like one of the base base game bosses. We have Puppet King Edelheart. He's got a massive sword. A massive sword. Also, interestingly, interestingly enough, he's got like a gap in his arm where his arm is like not there. I don't think I don't think I even see his arm in between those uh, like ribbon things. Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. You can see actually the, the cables. I mean, it's in the name Puppet King. You can see the cables going up into the throne. That's cool. Ooh, the Devil of Smelted Fears. That guy looks badass. And we have the Panzer Dragon of Velder. The Panzergeist, which is one of the expansion vassals. A Stonemason Knight. And Stonemason Knight is one of the knights that you can get, I think, right? Um, For the expansion. The Devour Dragon. Oh, no, maybe not. Maybe Stonemason Knight is a vassal. Someone, someone that you fight. Interesting. Um, all right, so we have the knights. So these are the base knights. These are who you're going to be playing. We have Kara the Wilder Knight. Kara, a war orphan, was raised by the Wilder Knights, an en enigmatic order of exiles who renounced the evils of civilization and now live among the wilderness, tending to what they call as the nature's garden. As Kara ventures into the Forbidden Stone City, she cannot escape the shadow of her childhood. Um... Cool. We have Sir Sant the Tracker, who's the one with the little monkey. Sir Sant, a legendary night tracker past his prime, is looking for that last blaze of glory and revenge for what has happened to his family all his years ago. Little does uh, little does know, 
that the kingdoms have little concern for his petty wishes and instead pull him into the, an intrigue most foul, one that could possibly hasten the arrival of the curse in the border kingdoms. We also have Flesh Rider, the Butcher King. As boisterous as he is simple-minded, the Flesh Rider follows a simple code of his order. Eat or be eaten. Preferably eat good and grow fat with power. The Creed brings the Flesh Rider to Kingdoms Forlorn, where powerful quarries were left to grow on their own brand of power. Little does he know he is on a trial of an age-old secret, one purposefully buried within the deep fog. I love all the meat attached to him, so he just wants to eat stuff. Creepy. Okay, and last but not least, we have Renholder. A Renholder is a mage knight with a penchant for the melodramatic. His grim demeanor is offset by the voice of the face, a mysterious being shackled to his very soul by a grave mistake. Or is it all just in his head? Renholder doesn't know anymore. All he remembers is a procession of children led into the night. He's got some cool looking armor. Not often you see mages in armor, so that's a, a nice look. Uh, oh yeah, here's Stoneface. Uh, so Stoneface is the expansion knight that you can get. Uh, Stoneface has been cursed by a spell eerily similar to what has once happened to the inhabitants of the Principality of Stone. He, th uh, he thought he was doomed to a life of quiet despair among the people, but never truly, won uh, never truly one of them. But now the fog lifts and the Principality is once again accessible. Maybe he'll find a cure there. Or peace. Peace would be nice too. Um, oh, here we go. Uh, oh, soon. They don't have it up yet. So the try the tabletop simulator demo of Kingdoms Forlorn soon. Experience a full delve into the Principality of Stone with a complete story chapter for each of the four core game nights. Test your metal against a mob of Ironcast dead and challenge the grotesque Egg Knight in an epic boss fight. Boss fight. So that's great to hear. So it's nice that they not they aren't only having either the Dell fight phase or the boss fight phase. It seems like you're able to get the full main experience. Um, so it seems like it's going to be replicating the uh, prototype. So that's good to have, or that's good to know. That's really, really cool. So I'll be doing a full gameplay video of that once the tabletop simulator demo is up. So definitely keep your eye on uh, for that. And of course we have some uh, YouTube videos highlighting uh, the game and some content creator stuff. Oh, if only, if only I could be in there. Um, would be nice. Would be nice to have that prototype. Uh, okay, so pro they have a prototype versus final game. Interesting. So at Into the Unknown, we believe it is an iterative process, uh, iterative process and don't trick... Uh, Kickstarters as a pre-order store. Kingdoms for Lauren prototype is just that, a jumping off point to be built upon. The game is still a work in progress, should be treated as such. The quality of miniatures, cards, tokens, art is not final. The contents shown in the prototype are merely a sample of a much larger game that includes a lot more enemies, adventures, quests, and components. In fact, there is more than 10 times the content of the prototype in the final game, and that's before any stretch goals. We are actively working to make the final game the best fantasy crawler experience there is, including things like updating readability, enhancing accessibility, and so on. One major, uh, one major thing are that uh, uh, one major are that has seen a steady progress is the UI, including the medieval-inspired font. See a comparison video below. Yeah, so I already saw, I believe, Liege of Games or something, and one of the content creators who has the prototype commented on this. Uh, so they are already like doing pretty heavy overhauls to the art and the way it's worded. The old old medieval fantasy inspired art is always super nice to have, but it is a lot tougher to read. And it's nice they are making the game more accessible. And personally, I do like the cleaner style anyways. Um, when you are being when you are having to manage so many things, it's gonna be nice to have just clear font, easy to read, and pick things out. Um, they also uh, changed the way the directions and, and uh, different uh, iconography on the tile cards are because uh, they were fairly small on the previous design, so it's nice they enlarged them, they made things more clear. Again, again, if these are the updates we can expect throughout the whole Kickstarter, I think it's going to be it's going to shape up to a pretty full-fledged uh full-fledged product. Um fingers crossed they just keep that momentum up. They're off to a great start. I'm I'm excited to see the prototype rule book. Um and yeah, uh, oh, shipping. Okay, so the European Union's USA, Canada and Australia zones will be shipping friendly. Yes, go Canada. Uh, backers from these countries will suffer no import taxes. Uh, VAT and sales tax included in prices. Great. Uh, that is fantastic. So shipping will be charged after the... Okay, so that, yeah. Pretty pretty straightforward if you've done Kickstarter stuff. Um, so here are the estimates for shipping a standard core game of Kingdoms Forlorn. Uh, it's around 8 kilograms. That's, that's a heavy game. Uh, keep in mind, these are just estimates and costs may rise. Yada, yada, yada. Uh, so Canada, for me, it's going to be 39 to $44. Okay. So in total, this game will cost me about 250 bucks, Which is... 
I mean, it's a lot of money, but they are offering a ton of game. Uh, I mean, just as much, if not uh, more than Kingdom Death Monster. And Kingdom Death Monster, you're, of course, paying like double the price. Um, I, I, for for what they're touting and how much features they have in the game, it, it's a reasonable price. Um, I, I, I would have been very, very surprised if it was like around $300. So I'm really glad that's not the case. Um, but I definitely did not expect it to be under, under $150. Um, so this game is an advanced state of development, both in terms of mechanics and art. We're aiming for a November 2023 shipping date. This estimate is for the core game of Kingdoms for Lorne. Any expansions will be shipped in waves in 2024. Uh, now... I doubt they're going to hit that 2023 shipping date. Uh, again, just with how the world is right now and how Kickstarters in general go, from what I hear, I don't think they're going to get that shipping date. Um, but hey, if, if it happens, you know, I, I would love to be proved wrong. Um, so again, we're looking at at least no no less than a, a year and a half uh, for this game to actually, or uh, two years, sorry, for this game to actually be out. Um, so it's going to be a long wait, but uh, I'm sure Aeon Trespass Odyssey will definitely hold my attention until then because that's also a huge, huge game. And that's it. So that is a full-fledged rundown of the Kickstarter, its features, what they're expecting, uh, what they're hoping for, some of the stretch goals, expansion, and how much it's going to cost you. And uh, yeah, if you stuck around for this whole video, thank you so much for watching. Uh, I will definitely be making a full video on the Tabletop Simulator demo when we actually are able to play that. So keep your eye on it for that. Um, thank you so much. And I will, uh, I mean, I, I put in a request for a prototype copy. We'll see if I get it. Probably not, but it's it's okay. I will, of course, be keeping up to date on this Kickstarter. I'm not going to be um, making a video on every single little update. I'll probably do it in milestones, like when something really, really big happens or like a huge stretch goal is unlocked. I'll probably make a quick video just updating people on that. So if you do want Kick uh, Kingdoms for Lauren updates, definitely hit the subscribe button. And uh, yeah, and thank you so much for watching. So until next time, take care and have a good one.